Okay, folks, thank you for taking the time to fill out the evals. I, I, I really take them very seriously and I appreciate your feedback and hopefully we can use that to make things better um, both at my teaching level and the course um, as well. So what we're going to do today is we're going to start off by recapping, you know, how, how control flow and hijacking attacks work. Then we're going to see by looking at their main components, how we can we defend against these kinds of attacks? And then finally, um, how can we, um, how can an attacker actually overcome those defenses? Okay. So let's quickly recap what we were talking about. So we talked about control flow, hijacking, attacks, which are basically when an attacker takes control of our flow of execution and takes us to somewhere that's under the attacker's control, right? So the same thing as they take over the steering wheel and they drive us into some place or some area where they control, they run any code they want, and then they can drop a shell or do any kind of damage that they want from that um, area of them. So the way the control flow hijacking attacks work. So let's say we have a function. It takes two arguments, argument one, argument two. First, we're going to have the callers stack. So the, the function that called this function um, is going to have its own stack. Then we're going to push the arguments in reverse order. So arg2, arg1. And after that, we will remember where we should return to. So that's the return address. And after that, we remember the caller's frame pointer. And we set the EBP register to this memory location. And finally, we have the local variables. And the way the control flow hijacking attacks take place is by exploiting a vulnerability in this function, specifically in its local variables. In a sense, the attacker is going to overflow some buffer in here is going to start putting in some random stuff in here, some bogus information, maybe some instructions, until they get to the return address. What they're going to do is they're going to overwrite the return address, so overwrite, and put in a value that they themselves control. So one thing they can do is they can put code in here and then jump that code. Okay, so that's pretty much how a control flow hijacking attack works. So as we have talked, the control flow hijacking attack is composed of two steps that the attacker is going to have to do. The first step is they have to overflow a buffer. So that's what we call exploit a vulnerability. So the act of overflowing a buffer is an exploit of a vulnerability in our code. And then number two, they're going to execute um, code or malicious code. And we call this a stop code execution or payload, depending on the type of the attack. Okay, so the part of this lecture today is we're going to see how we can defend against each one of those um, two types of attacks. So let's start off with number one, overflowing a buffer. So issue one. The attacker is going to over or is going to exploit the vulnerability of a buffer overflow in our code. So, what do you think we can do to counter buffer overflows? Um, 
Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So one thing we can do, call this A, is bounce, bounce check it. So basically what we want to do is that every memory access is checked or out of bounds exceptions. So this is like um, there's languages such as Java or Python that actually implement bounds checking for. <coughs> so why do you think since bounds checking is actually really helpful, why do you think C does not do bounds checking? Why is it that they kind of stay away from doing that? Yeah. So that feels like speed. Yes, exactly. So in here, notice that every memory access have to be checked, right? So we have to go every time we access memory, we have to make sure that it's within bounds. And this has a performance <coughs> penalty. So we have to pay time to actually make those checks, which is why C chooses, because C is written for applications that require, you know, a lot of control from the user and a lot of speed, such as a kernel, for example, an operating system, right? A very high speed um, algorithm. So we don't have time to do bounds checks. You either write good code or you write bad code. If you write bad code, live with it. That's 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 the, the, the motto of C in a sense, right? So what other things you can think of in terms of um, countering buffer overflows? So here's a hint. When we were trying to go at figuring out where our, um, our exploits were, we had to run it through GDB and actually figure out um, where the attacker's code is going to be, right? Or where, our, where the return address is saved. What's the address of the place we want to jump to? What do you think we can do to kind of prevent the attacker from doing that? Yeah. Store the return address below the variable. So that's that's actually a good idea. We're going to do something that's along those lines, right? So the idea is that let's go. Back. So we if we change the placement of the return address, so these are the local variables, and the exploit grows in this direction, right? Um, if we actually store the return address in here. then we kind of get around the idea of having a buffer overflow. Even if there's a buffer overflow, it's not going to overwrite the return. The problem is that we want to pop these off the stack before reading the return address. Right? So when we want to return from a function, we want to pop everything. So in a sense, free up memory and then return. This prevents us from doing that. So one thing, we, one way to get around that is we're going to keep the return address where it is, but we're going to introduce what we call stack canaries. So what the, the, where the name comes from is in the old days where people were working in mines a lot. Um, and they didn't have the technology to detect gas leaks. What they used to, they used to bring in a canary and they put it in inside of the um, the mine. If there is a gas leak, the canary is going to die before the humans because they're much more sensitive to them, to, to to gases. So when the canary dies, they know that there's a gas leak and they can leave. So we're going to do something very similar in that we're going to put a canary on our stack, and if that canary dies 
we know that there's a segmentation form. We know that there's something changing. And the way this happens is right after the return address, we're going to put a canary value. And we're going to store a copy of the value in a special register. OK, so let's say I am an attacker now and I want to overwrite to the return address. Once I get to here, I have to overwrite the canary value as well. If I overwrite the canary value, it's no longer going to match the one that's being stored here. And then we can detect that there is a stack smashing happening. So here, uh, one thing to, to, to um, relate this to is sometimes when you run a program, you don't get a segmentation fault. You get a stack smashing happening. So that's probably you overrode the canary at some place. Right? So here's how things are, are going to happen. Every time we return, check canary value. If it's valid, so if it meet, if it's the same as the one in the register, then return. Otherwise, use a, or, or fault in a sense. Either a segmentation fault or a stack smashing fault or whatever is um, your input. Okay, so every time I want to return, I need to make sure that my canary is still alive. If the canary is dead, meaning that the canary has been overwritten, this means that I have a potential stack smashing attack. Now, the problem with this one is the following. Well, who says that the attacker cannot read the value of the canary? Right? We've all, all we've been doing now is writing to the stack, but there's nothing preventing us from reading the stack. So if the attacker can read the canary, they don't have to overwrite it, and then they can um, kind of get across the, um, the, the, the stack canary defense. So, you can see now that how this, the game starts playing. Do you have an attack? The defenders come in and make the attacker's life harder, but then you get a more persistent attacker that they get, get around it, and then you have to do something else, right? It's kind of like a, this this play of cat and mouse um, happening in in, in 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 computer security. Um, the last defense that we're going to talk about on this front is. Um, what we call ASLR, ASLR. So here's the, the idea behind ASLR. Um, so far, addresses have been static. So what do we mean by addresses have been static? If I know this address, let's say, if this is address is hex 08, 04, uh, 5, A, E, F. Every time I run the program, this is going to be the same. So far, this is what we've been assuming. What ASLR comes into play is it's going to actually say, well, that's not a good idea. We're going to randomize the address space. And this stands for address space layout randomization. So each time you run this program, you're going to be in a different place in memory. You're going to be in a different place in, um, in, in terms of physical memory. You're going to be in different addresses. So you can't really guess where things are going to be. Or you can guess, but you can't know where things are going to be. You can you can try to guess if you know what random number we're using, but if you don't go that far, you cannot um, you, you cannot know the exact place in memory where we're going to. Right. So um, that's why 
So that's ASLR. And that's why in the assignment, I'm asking you to disable this um, ASLR. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to conduct the attacks that we actually do in the assignment. Um, so that's the reason why um, I, I ask you to do that. OK, questions so far? Yeah. Um, I guess, how do you implement the ASLR into the code? Yeah, all right, that's a good question. Yes, um, that's a good question. So here's how things are going to happen. Each time I run the program, I'm going to put the entire piece of chunk, chunk of memory space in a different place. So this means that the starting address changes. But we everything is fixed relative to the starting address. So once I know the starting address, I know I can, I can figure out everything. But before I know the starting address, I cannot know what's going to happen. Um, and this type of code is called a position independent code or PIC. So that's why when you compile, sometimes you see this flag minus F PIC. So that means generate position independent code. OK, and it's um, ASLR is a feature provided by the kernel. And this is the compiler. Well, um, so the entire address space, in a sense, is true. Um, yeah, so the, the entire block text, code, data, uh, heap, and stack are all shifted to them. Questions? Yeah. So then why wouldn't they be able to just GGG through the code, get the starting address, or, or one of them, one of the values, and then just Guessing from there. So that's that depends on how well you do things randomly, right? Because if you run it in GDB once, you get a starting address. And then if you run the program again, you're going to get a different starting address. <coughs> if you use a terrible random number generator, the attacker can use one value to guess what the second value is. But if you're using a good random number generator, then using one value, you shouldn't be able to guess what the next one is. So that's how things happen in a sense. Every time you run the program, you get a new app. All right. So let's focus on um, issue number two, which is code execution. <coughs> so what do you think we can do to prevent the attacker from executing code? So as we saw, what the attacker is doing is they're going to dump a piece of code on the stack, and then they're going to execute that piece of code. What do you think we can do to stop them from doing that? So other than preventing them from, of, of, um, from overflowing buffers. So here's a question. In the layout of the memory address space, where is the program's code? And it's in the text section. Where is the attacker injecting its, its code? Not there. Not there, right? So why on earth? Are we allowing someone to put in code not in the text section and then execute that code? 
that doesn't make any sense, right? Unless you have to, there are codes that, um, that are called self-modifying code. We're not gonna worry about those for now. Um, we're just gonna say that your code is in the text region. Why are you executing from the stack? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna introduce a defense called WXORX. So this means a memory page is either writable or executable but never both. Okay? So any memory page you can write to, you cannot execute from. And any memory page you execute from, you cannot write to. You can never have the two combination together or together. Um, so it's either writable or executable. You cannot allow for pages to be write writable and executable at the same time. And the nice thing about it is that this is hardware enforced. So it's not dependent on a piece of code. It's in built into the hardware. The hardware knows that if I try to execute code from a writable section, it will generate a hardware fault and not a software fault. So the hardware is going to tell you something bad is going on. And you can't really do, unless you want to put it in a chip in there, you can't get around. OK, questions? All right, so it seems that this WX or X attack is really, really, or defense is really good. So as an attacker, what do you think you want to do? How can you get around this? Yeah. So um, pretty much you're not going to be able to because that's also set by the hardware at the end. So you can't use new code. What else could you do? Yes, so not break, but use it, right? There is a big bunch of code in the text area. Why just not use something from there? There is a lot of functions there that could be useful. And the counter or the, the um, getting around. WX or X. Is called return. To libc attack. So libc is a huge library that provides um, a bunch of features and system calls. So what do we mean by a system call? A system call is pretty much a function call that actually transfers execution from the user into the kernel. So think of it for, for example, what happens when you do your module, you write your read handler. Okay? When you write your read handler, the user is going to issue a read, but then the kernel is going to execute the read handler. Right? So there is a transfer that's happening. The user issues a command. The kernel runs this command on, on behalf of the user and then returns the, the, the outcome back to the user. So that's exactly um, what a system call um, pretty much is. And unfortunately, libc, not unfortunately, fortunately, but at the same time, kind of like uh, unfortunately, uh, libc is full of wrappers around system calls and full of functions that an attacker can exploit. One of these functions, is called, unsurprisingly, system. So what system does is it's going to 
run a command in a shell. So system runs a command in a shell. So system takes one argument, which is the command you want to execute. So if I do echo um, hello in here, and I call system, then I'm going to see on the screen hello. Right? It's going to execute echo hello in a shell. So if I am I, I as an attacker, if I can call system with bin as h as an input, then I can cause the creation of a shell. Right? I can cause the creation of a shell and gain control over that shell and write whatever I want in there without actually putting any code on the, the stack. I just called system as if the program was calling system. So how do you think we can do that? How do you think we can call system without actually calling system? So that's one one thing you can do. But what if echo hello is somewhere on, you know, that's not close to your because it's a constant, it might go to the date and such. So you're not gonna be able to overwrite that. So what do you think we can do? How can I cause my code to go and execute system? <coughs> How did we yesterday cause print bad outcome to execute instead of print good outcome? So that function was already on in the text section, and we were able to cause it to execute even though the user did not want it to execute. So how did we do that? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes, so instead of actually making a call, what we did is we changed this return address to go to print bad outcome, right? So now instead of doing print bad outcome, we're just going to go to system direct. So this is why it's called a return to libc. So instead of calling a function, I actually return into a function. So I overwrite the return address in a way that instead of calling a function, I'm returning into that function. So here's what the attacker is going to do. They're going to cause a buffer overflow. And then they're going to insert the address of system in here. What they're going to do next is they're just going to imitate a function call. So system expects to one argument. The argument is definitely going to be on this tag, right? So we have to have the argument of system on this tag. So what the attacker is going to do is going to make this part look as if there was a function call. So we push, you remember how we call a function? We push our arguments in reverse order, then we put the return address and we jump into the function. So the attacker is going to do the same thing. It's going to put bin 
sh here. They're going to put a whatever return address in here. It, ha it can be anything. It can be bogus. It can be all zeros. Doesn't matter. And then they're going to override this guy with the address of system. So that when we return from the vulnerable function, the stack pointer is going to be here. System is going to try to look here for its arguments. It's going to see bin sh. It's going to go and execute bin sh. OK. Does that make sense? All right, so you're going to do this in part five of the assignment. So this leaves us with part six. And part six is the um, kind of baking it further. So let's say I, as a defender, removed system. All right, no more system for. I'm not going to use it, and the attacker is not going to use it, and you know I'm just going to live without the system or, or the, the system function. So so far, the attacker has been using intentional code. So intentional code meaning that system was a function that I intended to use, that I intended to provide the user. What the user is going to, what the attacker is going to do now, if I remove intentional functions, they're going to use unintentional code, which is code that is there, but it was not meant to be used in that case, in that way. And it's actually going to be a code of the form, instruction one, instruction two. So it's going to be machine code followed by a return, such that in here we have no jumps or returns. So in a sense, it's going to pick a bunch of instructions that execute sequentially, then followed by a return. This piece of code, this piece of machine code is called a gadget. And this technique is called return oriented program. So if I can find enough of these small instructions followed by return, small instructions followed by return, small instructions followed by a return. It has been shown that you can write any program using those things. So this is what we call, it's a Turing complete language. So in a sense, if you can write the Java code, you can write that exact same code using return oriented gadgets, right? Um, if you can write something in C, you can write the same thing using return-oriented gadgets. And the surprising thing is, in that small binary that I gave you in um, part six, there is 32K gadgets. 32,000 or even a little bit more of those gadgets that an attacker can use. Those are not code that I intended to use, but they're there because I happen to compile a code and you know generated things of the form instruction one, instruction two, return, instruction one, instruction two, return, and so on and so. So the goal of the attacker is to stitch enough gadgets together to execute. arbitrary code. So let's take an example. Let's say I, as an attacker, I want to put the value that be in the register EDX. One way to do this in machine instructions is I pop the contents of the memory in register EAX, I move EAX into EDX, and I return, or I'm done. So let's say we search for gadgets, and we found two gadgets. First gadget is pop EAX return, 
And second gadget is move EAX, EDX, and then return. So what the attacker is going to do is going to say, OK, here's how I'm going to construct my attack. I will overwrite your return address and make it point to this guy. So I, I put in here address of one. So what's going to happen when I call one? One is going to execute this piece of code. It's going to pop something from the stack and the return. So when it pops something from the stack, it's going to pop whatever is in here. Right? Because that's where the stack pointer is after we return. So I can insert the value that be in here. So that when this instruction happens, when this instruction happens, I'm going to pop this guy from the stack. Then I'm going to return. And what do you think I'm going to put in the return address in here? Two, the address of two. So return here. And then execute move EAX EDX. And that's how I can use gadgets to achieve any piece of code that I actually wanted to do. What you're going to do in part six is you're going to use this approach to actually implement um, the shell code that I actually gave you. So you're going to use this to drop into a root shell. Right? So I give you, um, I don't give you much instructions, but I give you a paper that you can reference to figure out how to, what exactly are the instructions that you want to um, make use of. And then you can use a tool called ROP gadget to find gadgets in your code. Um, and there's plenty of those as um, we just mentioned. OK, so that's everything for um, this class. Thank you guys for sticking around and um, for being my lab um, guinea pigs for in figuring out the project and trying to improve on that. I appreciate all the feedback you gave me um, in milestones one and two. Um, and yeah, milestones one and two. And I hope to see you guys around um, next year, I guess. All right.